All right, so welcome back everybody. Um, for this lecture, I do have some required reading, and again, it's in the textbook, the Garrett uh, Biochemistry First Canadian Edition, and I've listed the pages there. And also another article that I posted on Quirkus uh, entitled The Replication Fork, Understanding the Eukaryotic uh, Replication Machinery and the Challenges to Genome um, Duplication. So I posted those on Quirkus, uh, and please have a, a read through the required material. And there is also a study task that I would like you to pursue uh, that is also posted on Quirkus. It has to do with this drug called uh, gemtisidabine. Um, this is a care, uh, chemotherapeutic drug that is used in the treatment of a number of cancers. Um, it is one of the first line treatments for pancreatic, from which I guess you could surmise um, doesn't really seem to work all that well. But um, at any rate, it's a pretty interesting drug in terms of what it can do um, to do DNA replication and other functionalities in the cell. So I'd like you to look at them, uh, of those questions, and think about them in the, just in the context of what I've been talking to you about for DNA replication. OK, so uh, what am I going to be talking about today? So I'm first going to go over or cover the things that we started from the last lecture. And we're going to talk about a few experiments that I think are pretty interesting. I am then going to try to convince you that DNA replication is not just a one enzyme functionality, that in fact it is carried out by a collaboration uh, between a group of different enzymes. And then I will introduce you to an assay for a class of enzymes called DNA helicases. And I'll describe an experiment based on a DNA polymerase assay, um, which I hope will probably then put it all together in some kind of uh, sensible summary. Last time, we had just started talking about the muscle sun and stall experiment. I had probably been going on about um, how fantastic it is, and it really truly is a fantastic experiment. It's a very nice one. Um, so as I mentioned, the thing that was nice about this experiment to me is that um, they had several different kinds of models that had been proposed at the time for how DNA replication might be occurring within cells. And they devised a very simple, straightforward experiment to distinguish between these three possibilities. So as I mentioned last time, um, the possibilities that they were considering were um, one a semi-conservative model where you start with two parental strands. The parental strands are then separated to serve as templates for the synthesis of the daughter strands. And the result is two hybrid models, uh, molecules, each of which contain a parental strand and a newly synthesized strand. Now, the second model was a conservative model approach where the parental strands would still serve as templates for synthesis, but at the end of the reaction, the two parental strands uh, come back and associate with each other, and the two newly synthesized strands uh, also so associate with each other. And then there's this sort of this nunny random dispersive model that involves sort of a a suspicion that you perhaps you couldn't unwind the complementary DNA strands without causing some kind of backbone breakage. And the prediction for this kind of uh, synthesis model would be that each daughter molecule would be a mixture of parental and uh, newly synthesized uh, strands. And I think I did give you, start to give you a layout of how um, this experiment was performed. The idea is that um, you want to be able to distinguish the parental strand from the newly synthesized strand. And the way they decided to do this was based on density. Okay, so um, based on density. Okay. Um, and the way they did it was based on density and is by taking advantage of the different non-radioactive isotopes of nitrogen that have different densities. So um, we know that um, normally nitrogen is N14. Okay. Um, 
and there's a nitrogen isotope, N15. Okay, so normally we have the N14. Um, and instead of that, um, they added N15. Okay, um, so normally uh, you can think about it that normal DNA would be comprised of nitrogen-14 atoms. If instead as a, a nitrogen source, you feed your E. coli with uh, ammonium chloride that is N15, um, you can produce E. coli cells where the DNA is fully substituted with the denser um, nitrogen isotope. Okay, so uh, what they did, uh, they grow the E. coli. Um, uh, so E. coli cells, are fully uh, substituted um, with N15, okay? Um, so you grow them for a lot of generations in N15. Um, and so, um, you know, by 14 generations, um, you're able to produce, you know, the fully subsidized uh, dense DNA. And then you transfer this um, to a media that contains a uh, regular N14 as the nitrogen source. So you do this for 14 generations. And then you transfer it to media that contains N14. So it's a 14 media. Okay. Um, so you know this um, new media contains a regular N14 nitrogen source. So after that, um, your newly dis synthesized DNA, rather than containing N14, is going to contain, uh, um, rather than containing N15, will contain N14. Okay, so it becomes less dense. From the parental N15 strands. And so then um, they allow the cells to continue to grow and replicate and divide in the presence of N14. Um, and then they just sample at different times. So as they're growing in the N14, they sample at different times. And then they have to have some means of separating based on density. So then they separate based on density. Uh, and then I did go through this um, last time. Um, so what they would do, is they would make an extract of these cells and then apply it to a density gradient. So again, if we had our test tube, we would have um, a solution of cesium chloride. And again, cesium chloride is denser at the bottom. Um, again, this is an important property. So if you're measuring the density of it, the density is low at the top and high at the bottom. And then they would layer their extract, so their DNA the top and centrifuge this thing. Okay, so centrifugation. And the DNA will migrate uh, into the gradient and it will stop at the position of the gradient where the cesium chloride density is equal to the DNA density. So um, the DNA migrates and stops where um, the cesium chloride density is equal to the DNA density. Okay, and um, 
So typically, uh, you know, the DNA is super soluble in the cesium chloride, and it would migrate uh, as it's being centrifuged to, um, you know, the, the cesium chloride density, and that's where it would stop. So after that, you would typically get something that would look like this, um, where your, now your DNA is of uniform density. It has migrated to, to its position within the gradient. Um, so, okay, so here's the DNA. Um, so how do we know where it is? Uh, DNA is not like purple or anything. So how could we tell where it is in the gradient? So um, this was a puzzle. Um, because it's not like it's uh, being able to be visualized as a precipitate. So um, we could actually, you know, read a label here, the DNA. Um, that was a possibility, but they didn't do that though here. Um, one property of, the act of DNA that they actually took advantage of was that DNA absorbs UV light. So you can actually um, shine UV light and get UV absorption. Um, and the DNA will appear as a dark band. Okay, um, and so basically we'll see it as a dark band in, in the gradient, and so that's basically uh, what they did. So that's the assay. So hopefully the slide uh, looks familiar. We started talking about it last time. Um, so we'll just sort of look at a schematic of this experiment and, and then at their actual data, which I think is quite nice and quite clear. Um, and the first thing I really want to do is orient you. Um, so I drew the density gradient um, like this. So we see it here. Um, but uh, I think conceptually it's more complex and I really want you to turn it on its side um, so that you can see that the top of, um, of the gradient is here and then the bottom of the gradient is there. Okay, so just um, you know, turn it on its side. And uh, here's this dark band uh, right here, which is the result of shining UV on this thing, which is the DNA. So you can see that when we're starting, the DNA is migrating into the density gradient as a species of uh, one density. So there's just one kind uh, of DNA, and this would be the fully uh, substituted dense DNA containing the nitrogen 15, because at time zero, we have yet to transfer it to the light media. So I'll just write that here. This band is, um, uh, one kind of DNA, and it's the fully substituted DNA with um, N15, and that's at generation zero. Okay, so then we transfer it, and then they sample at different times, and you can see the different times of generations, uh, 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.7, and so on. And then the first point that we would actually care about is actually at the one generation point, right? Okay, so what do we see at one generation? What's the observation? Well, we can actually see that it's, it's shifted to the left from that original um, dark band, right? Okay. Um, so what does that indicate? It indicates that it's less dense than the parental strand, okay? Uh, anything else that you can note about the one generation time point? Well, the key thing is there's only one band. Um, so that's indicative of one species. So we have one species and we've got a little lighter in density. So now we can consider what the models would predict. So let's first consider um, the conservative model here at the top. Um, so you would start with two parental strands, both N15. And so you know the single dense species is what we would see at point zero. And if you go through one generation through the conservative model, um, 
because it's predicting that the parental strands will come back together and the newly synthesized strands will come back together, um, this model actually predicts that there should be two bands, one dense and one light, right? So if we see that here, uh, we've got two bands after one generation, uh, one dense and one light. Okay, so do we see two bands, the first generation? No. So it's uh, obvious, isn't it? Uh, we don't. Um, so immediately you can eliminate this, um, this first model. Okay, very simple experiment. Simple prediction uh, allows you to distinguish between the possibilities you're considering. So now we can consider um, the other two models. So that was the first model, conservative, a second semi-conservative, and then the third, the random dispersive. So the semi-conservative um, predicts that after one generation, both of the daughter molecules will have one parental strand and one newly synthesized strand. So if we're looking at the first generation here. Um, so they should be of lower density because they have a heavy and a light chain. And there should only be one species, right? And this is what we um, see here. So does this agree with what we are seeing at the one generation time point? It does, right? So at this point, this is an entirely um, viable model. Okay, so we'll check that off. Um, and then if we go to the random dispersive, which, you know, it's hard to believe anyone could have thought this would be the case, but it actually predicts the same thing in terms of the first generation. Um, it predicts that both the daughter molecules will be mixed of parental and newly synthesized strands. So again, it would predict um, one species uh, um, of lighter uh, density than the original uh, parental. So after one generation, the data is actually looking consistent with both models. Okay, so what do you do? Um, you actually keep going so that, you know, they collected more samples um, and they did this for the 1.1, 1 1.5, 1 and 1.9, which I guess, you know, is close enough to the second generation time point. So um, at this point, you know, what do we see at the second generation? We actually see uh, two bands. I'll just circle that there. So what you have um, is that you still have the same density as a single band. So you have two bands now, but you still have one that is the same density as the single band that it was in the first generation. And then one that's lighter still, so it's shifted to the left. And again, you can refer back to the models of semi-conservative um, at the second generation to see what it predicts. And if we look here, it actually predicts um, that you should have two molecules that are light light and two molecules that are of the hybrid density. And so two species totally consistent with what we observe. Um, in contrast, if you look at the random dispersive, um, what it predicts is again one species, um, if you look down here, uh, of a mixture of both parental and non-parental at a lighter density. And, you know, obviously, um, you know, we don't see a single species at the two generation time point, thereby eliminating the random dispersive model. So this model still works, um, whereas this one can be eliminated at the second generation. So pretty clean experiment, pretty clean result. And, um, you know, have a look in your free time and try to devise, um, you know, using the, uh, these two models or these three models, uh, what would happen with, uh, you know, when they would go to three and four generations? So if you went, you know, further, you know, what do you expect? Also, if you just, you know, continued with a semi-conservative replication model through a couple of subsequent generations. And the one last thing I want to point out about this particular experiment is that, you know, this is an in vivo experiment, right? Okay, so it's an in vivo experiment. Okay. Um, 
So this is actually showing how the DNA is actually replicated intracellularly in an E. coli cell. Um, so the one thing that's ni nice about this is that you know you're in a position to sort of impose some limitations, um, like what an in vitro reaction would do. Um, so for example, since the semi-conservative model, which we now uh, accept, predicts the two parental strands have to become disengaged from each other and serve as templates for new DNA synthesis, you might infer that we would need, um, in an in vitro replication uh, assay or reaction, some kind of enzyme that was capable of actually separating the two parental DNA strands. So in that way, you can sort of use um, in vivo experiments to inform you of in vitro experiments and kind of create this sort of information cycle. Okay, so basically you can use this in vivo information to ask what would uh, an in vitro experiment do. And again, we need an enzyme that would be able to separate the strands. Okay, so um, if you're interested in hearing further about this from Musselson himself, there's a nice short um, little video commentary uh, by him on the experiment and how it was developed. And there's a little nice retrospect that you can read as well if you're interested. And in this slide, you can see uh, Matt uh, Musselson here on the left, and on the right, that's Frank Stahl. And kind of hiding herself in the foreground is Martha Chase. And so this is the Chase of Hershey and Chase that provided evidence that DNA was the genetic material. So some pretty astonishingly excellent scientists hanging out in this photo. The next experiment that I want to talk to you about is an experiment that was done by Joel Huberman and Art Riggs, and um, this was done in 1978. And what Huberman and Riggs set out to do was answer the question as to whether DNA replicated unidirectionally or bidirectionally. And the idea is kind of illustrated here. So if you consider an E. coli uh, chromosome, um, we know that E. coli chromosome uh, DNA is circular. So if we have uh, E. coli DNA, okay, um, the question is simply if you started replicating uh, on this chromosome um, from, uh, say, it's one position, um, do you have one replication fork that goes all the way around? Or do you have um, uh, two replication forks? So we can draw this another way. Um, so one that would go this way and one that would actually go this way. So these two replication forks um, that they synthesize, so sort of, you know, going bidirectionally around the circle and then, you know, meeting at, at some termination region. So that's what they're trying to distinguish with this experiment. Um, so we'll just delve into the details of this experiment. Um, they, for whatever reasons, decided to do this in um, mammalian cells. And uh, they were using uh, Cho cells, so Chinese hamster ovarian cells. And the idea is that they wanted to be able to follow DNA replication um, on individual molecules of DNA isolated from these eukaryotic cell. So the first thing they did is um, uh, was basically called a pulse label uh, with um, tritiated thymidine. So that's um, 3H here. So again, this is a, a labeling with tritiated thymidine. And they did this for um, a short period of time. 
And as always the case, you know, again, they were using thymidine uh, because RNA um, is not what we're studying here. So the thymidine, of course, being specific to DNA, uh, they're using the tritium label because they want to be able to follow the newly synthesized DNA by incorporation of this radioactive thymidine. Um, what pulse label means is that they're labeling just, again, for a short period of time. So they're applying tritiated thymidine to the cells, and then what they do um, is they follow this with a chase where they add in um, excess, you know, cold thymidine. So cold means unradioactive. So unradioactive uh, thymidine. And um, what they do then is they very gently, um, you know, to preserve the high molecular weight DNA, lyse the cells and then spread the DNA on a glass surface like a microscope slide. Um, so you can write here a microscope scope slide. So if we have it here, um, and it's actually kind of wild. I'll show you a picture in a moment. But at that point on the side, you have a bunch of DNA fibers that are really stretched out. So we'll see something like this. Um, and so now the game is, how do you uh, visualize these DNA fibers? And so they do this by virtue of the tritiated thymidine that um, has been incorporated, and they detect it uh, photographically. Okay, so photographically. And so basically what they're doing is they're taking the slide that they are coding it um, with a photographic emulsion. Okay, so they take the slide and then they code it with a photographic uh, emulsion. The emission from the thymidine will reduce the silver that's in the photographic em emulsion. So um, the emission from Uh, the tritium will reduce the silver that's uh, in the emulsion, okay? And uh, when they develop it, um, they can see an image, kind of like an old-time uh, photograph. So uh, they will develop and they will get an image. Um, and this image is called a fiber autoradiography, which makes a little bit uh, more sense right, uh, right there because they're looking at DNA fibers and they're doing so um, because the fibers are emitting energy and they're producing an autoradiograph of themselves. Um, so what's really wild about this, it takes a long, 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 long time to, to actually, you know, um, you know, they were exposing these things for months. So, you know, the design cycle of your experiments, if it's extremely long, um, uh, I think, you know, there's some benefit to actually, uh, you know, planning things uh, carefully. Because if you do the experiment and then you got to hang out, uh, you know, at Starbucks for three months before you see what your result is, of course, you want to have some certainty that you don't mess up. Um, so after these were developed, they simply just looked, um, at them under the microscope. All right, so now let me just give you a sense of what the prediction is from this sort of experiment and uh, sort of explain why they're actually doing it in this way. In this way. And I, I actually believe I misspoke in the previous slide where I said that this experiment took place in 1978, but it was 1968. So um, do make that correction in your notes. So what I've done here is I've actually replaced, if you can see up at the top, um, the tritiated thymidine with um, uh, some sunflowers uh, labeled with tritium. And uh, you know, when you introduce some of these uh, sunflowers, um, the sunflowers get incorporated at the points where DNA is being synthesized. And this is what we characterize as the pulse uh, stage. So if we 
introduce this, you know, radial labeled uh, tritium, which is represented as sunflowers, um, you know, they get incorporated where uh, the DNA is being synthesized.